Welcome back. So for this lecture, we're going to be building on what we've talked about in the last several lectures and in our class practice and going from deciding what that pattern is with the different steps for phonemes and allophones to turning this into a more formalized rule, something that's more of a shorthand that allows us to write out what's happening without having to put out the full paragraph or statement in prose. So these phonological rules are things that we're already doing when we're looking at these phoneme and allophone problems and we're using them to describe regular and predictable changes in a language. And these are used in a couple of ways. So what we're doing in this unit is focusing on the environment that we find allophones. So where does a sound become another sound in certain environments? Where do we get an allophone variation? But we also use these for historical changes as well, things that change over time in a language. And we'll see some examples of that later on in the semester when we are talking about historical linguistics. So the main thing to note for phonological rules is that there's certain symbols that are used when we're using this shorthand that will help us to write these rules and create something that looks like a shorthand rule rather than writing out the entire process in prose. So the symbols that you need to be familiar with are that an underlying phoneme uh, is going to go between slashes. So these slash brackets tell us that this is the sound we cannot predict. It's the sound we think of as speakers in our language. And so because it's more about the mental representation of that sound, it's in those slashes um, to signify that difference. The symbol that we use for becomes is just an arrow to the right to whatever the change is going to become. And then the allophones will go in square brackets. So square brackets represent the sound you're actually hearing. So in this case, you have your underlying phoneme, the sound we think of in language, and then in the square brackets, it's whatever that changes in that certain environment, because that's what you're actually producing, what you're actually hearing in the environment you're describing. And then we use a slash to say in the environment of, and then the symbol for environment that we talked about in previous lectures is still that underscore to say this is where that sound change happens. This is where um, you would see the different sound um, from whatever the underlying phoneme is. So we take these symbols to write rules. And so to give a couple of examples, we have, if there's a single sound change, the use of just the IPA characters themselves. So if we only have one sound that's changing, then we don't have to describe it using all of its features. It's easier, it's shorter to describe it using the symbols themselves. So if sound X becomes sound Y after sound Z at the end of words, then our rule would look like in slash brackets X, that's our underlying form, the form we're starting with, the arrow for becomes, and then in square brackets, Y, because that's the sound that we're actually hearing. And then we have that slash to say, this is the environment in which this is happening. This is what where we're going to see this. And then the environment that you have described, you would put into the visual of that environment. So if it's after Z and at the end of words, then you'd have your Z sound first, your underscore to say, this is where the sound change happens. And then you'd have your pound sign or hashtag after that to signify that that's a word boundary and that that's the end of the word. However, when we have changes that are based on features, if there's several sounds that are all behaving the same way, they're all behaving together, then we wanna use those features, those plus or minus features that we've talked about. So if I have a rule that says, voice plosives become voiceless whenever they're at the end of a word, then I would have a rule using those features because it's not just one single sound, it's several sounds in a language. And so this rule would look like in brackets, plus voice, plus plosive, which is what we're starting with, our voice plosives, our arrow for becomes, and then we'd have voiceless, so minus voice as our feature because that's what they're becoming. And so when we're using this, any feature that isn't changing, you don't need to put after the arrow because the only part that's in the arrow is whatever the change is taking place. It's only the part that's different that goes there. Our slash to say, this is the environment where it happens. And if this is happening at the end of a word, we don't need anything in front of our underscore because that part of our environment isn't helping us with our pattern. But the other side, the end of a word notation is important. So we would put that pound sign or hashtag there to say, this is where that takes place. It happens at the end of a word. And it's important to keep that distinction in mind, whether you're looking at just a single sound change or if you're looking at features, because you can just use an IPA symbol for sounds when it's a single sound change. But if you have multiple ones, then you're going to want to use those features, those plus or minus features. And the biggest reason for this is that we can't have an and or an or statement in our rules. We want just one single statement that tells us one pattern of what's going on without any sort of and or or.
So everything that's in that should just be one single rule that applies to the entire set of data you're looking at. So if we go back to the aspiration rule that we looked at um, in synchronous class with if we aspirate sounds in English or not, we'll look at that same data. And what we saw first was there were no minimal pairs. So we drew charts for our P and aspirated P, T and aspirated T, K and aspirated K. And then we noticed that these have to be allophones. We're never seeing them in the exact same space, in the exact same place, at the exact same time. They're always in complementary distribution, and we can predict where this is happening. So rather than writing out the full rule in prose and saying a voiceless plosive becomes aspirated at the beginning of words before vowels, we can use these features to create a shorthand rule that is going to convey the same information without having to write out the full paragraph. So we can instead say something that is plus plosive and minus voice, so our voiceless plosives, our arrow for becomes, and then what are they becoming? They're becoming aspirated. So that's this part that's changing, so we can just say plus aspirated in that case. And then we have our environment symbol for that slash, and then this happens at the beginning of words and before vowels. So we would have our pound sign or hashtag first, the underline um, underscore to show this is where the sound change happens, and then we use just a big V to cover the concept of vowels. If it doesn't matter which vowel it is, then we just use a large V. And we'll see other examples where if it's any consonant and it doesn't matter which one, we'll see a large C. So similar to the notation we saw when we were talking about syllable structure, the same thing applies in these rules where you can just put a, a big capital V for vowel or a big capital C for consonant. To look at a few other examples, if we look at our Japanese rule of s and sh um, that we looked at last week as well, again, we look for minimal pairs between these two specific sounds. We don't see any minimal pairs between s and sh. So we draw a chart, we see what the patterns are for that. And we determined that these were allophones in Japanese, that they had a specific environment in which they were going to appear. And so instead of writing out using features all of the things that are happening, instead of saying a voiceless alveolar fricative becomes a voiceless post alveolar fricative when it appears before a tense high front vowel, we can instead, since it's just one single sound change, use the symbols themselves to represent this. So our s sound, our s, is in the slash brackets as the underlying sound. And we have our arrow for becoming. And then in brackets, we have our sh sound because that's what we're hearing in this environment our slash for environment, and then the environment that this is happening in is before an E sound. It's just one single vowel. So all we have to do is put that underscore and then afterwards put that E symbol because it's only one single sound that's um, creating this change. So rather than using all of the features for that one sound, we can again use the symbol to represent that. And then the last example that we'll go back to and then we'll have a chance to talk about this in synchronous class again for more examples and more practice on rules. If we look at that Greek palatalization rule when we were looking at k and k and h and h, we noticed looking at that that we needed to create a chart. There were no minimal pairs between the sounds we were comparing. So we already knew that we have velar sounds that are becoming palatal sounds whenever they're occurring before front vowels. So we can then take those features and use our notation rules to say that when velars become palatals before front vowels, we can just use plus velar as our starting point. This is the sounds that we had at first, our arrow for becomes, and the change is that now they are palatal sounds, so we say plus palatal. Our big slash, and then the environment that this is happening in is whenever they're in front of front vowels. And we don't need a capital V, we don't need to specify vowels because front is a feature that can only apply to vowels anyway. So we have our underscore, and then after that, we have our feature of plus front. So we can't just put E comma A in that bracket because that would be an or situation, but they do share a feature of being plus front. So we can use that feature instead to cover that and create that notation. So it's really important again to remember that we wanna be as concise as possible we want to remove any redundancy. So in this case, these are all voiceless sounds, but we don't need to put voiceless because that's not changing at any point. So we don't need to add any additional features that aren't helping us. And we don't want to avoid any of those and or or statements. So we can't put E comma A into that bracket because that would be an or situation. We instead want to find the feature they have in common, 
and list the feature instead. So with any questions, shoot me an email, schedule office hours, and bring your questions to class. Our next synchronous class, we will be practicing using these rules, testing them out. We'll be looking at more of those phoneme and allophone problems and then creating actual rules for it. You'll also be given some examples of a rule that's in prose and how to write that into that more formalized notation. So bring questions to class and we'll have a chance to talk about that.